All right, here we go. Red coming down. You guys are gonna get to see these beautiful centerpieces at the top of this shelf. So our, our baker who uh, runs the oven, she's particularly talented as an artist. So uh, we have, for the last year, been working with her. You know, as I was working with her on how to score in general, we started to try to incorporate artwork in the scoring and you'll be able to see artwork across the board but especially on those top centerpiece loaves which are really designed with art in mind and sort of priced with art in mind uh, yeah. we we really make those so we make them in two ways, just kind of to our whims uh, as a standard centerpiece with a standard price. But then our customers are able to actually request whatever they want from Emerald. If they uh, use a form on our website to contact Emerald, she makes custom centerpieces that, that then customers bring to birthday parties or, or, or special events or have them as memories. Uh, so it's, it's just a fun way for her to be able to use her talent. We actually built these shelves for that original utility trailer and not for the lift gate, but it turns out that they fit just right. So we got away with it. And I've tried to figure out what the most efficient way to load and unload is and I've learned, at least for me, that getting everything unloaded first and then transporting everything makes the most sense. There's multiple bakers here at this market. Uh, one of our, I guess, rivals just showed up. Uh, I don't know if I don't know if rival's the right word though. Uh, the thing about bakeries at markets, I, I just think that there can be more than one uh, in, in most settings, even in small market settings. Uh, baked goods are approachable. Just about everybody consumes baked goods. So if you join a farmer's market as a bakery and there's other bakers there, it's actually a point of, of contention, really, in, in kind of your local, local culture. Some vendors get really upset once competition starts entering into marketplaces, but we don't really get to control the markets that we go to. You know, they're not our businesses. They're, uh, they have different missions than, than our own, and so I've never really held that expectation that I would be the only one there uh, selling bread. And I can't say that we've ever really suffered too much because of competition. Uh, I think if anything, it's just caused us to want to make a better product. Uh, at the markets, typically, we're not competing on price so much. I, like I don't, I don't really see it happening where people, people buy their loaf of bread from us because it costs seven and not, not eight but I think that we can really compete on quality. I think that we can incorporate better ingredients and I think that we can do better on fermentation. Um, and I think we can sort of give that story and that background to, to those people who are buying from us. And if you really believe in what you're making, uh, then a competitor, a competitor is not going to hurt you. If anything, a competitor will just motivate you to, uh, to keep refining. Then again, I sort of grew up in a competitive way. I grew up playing tennis uh, competitively. And so I don't have any qualms about, about competition, about winning some, losing some. Uh, but I've had to learn those, those lessons over time. And I think that if you haven't really had a lot of competitiveness in your background, 
then it's probably harder to, to deal with it uh, in any way uh, as an adult. Uh, I notice a difference when competitors aren't here. Like people, people come try our bread, but then I have an opportunity to win them over. You know, they, they try our bread and, and I don't have to win them over in any other way. Just try our bread. If you like it, come back. A lot of them do. So the markets have been nice to us because they are a constant way of getting in front of new faces. Um, you have every week at a farmer's market, somebody new is out. So uh, while they're stressful and sometimes more stressful than other ways of doing business, they, uh, they're, they're a way of advertising that you don't have to pay for. Uh, so, man, yeah, you can roll whatever you like over. I'm going to do the same. We don't need any tents at this market, so we are fully ready to start setting up. There's definitely an early morning uh, camaraderie here amongst other vendors. Uh, I haven't sort of, I haven't gotten into any close proximity with anyone yet, but. It's a lot of, everybody's kind of can relate to one another in this moment. Everybody's getting set up. So, you know, we're, we're always friendly to one another, although staying efficient as well, because there's a lot to do. Uh, but I think that everybody who participates in a farmer's market and sort of understands the, the hustle of making stuff and getting it safely here, uh, and sort of the workflow of these events being really what make you who you are as a, in, in your business and uh, professionally, there's just a, a way in which we all relate to one another, which is uh, neat. We were having some some regulatory hiccups with the city recently and certainly other farmers market vendors were amongst our supporters. <laughs> one of the challenges is parking lots and this one's notorious. Uh, I've definitely I've definitely had incidents here with this parking lot although not with not with actual fresh product. I'm pretty careful with the fresh product but on the way back, loading the truck, I've definitely spilled a couple times with equipment. And then you learn that there's all these kind of politics and dramas regarding parking lots. Like uh, who owns the parking lot versus the street versus the actual parking lot that the market's on. Come to find that there's different owners for all of them and so that's why certain Parts of the street are well paved and others, others are not. So similarly here I have a market, market half for live sales and then I have a pre-order half for things that have been already ordered. This market doesn't get as many pre-orders as it does do live sales and it's historically always been like that where for whatever reason less people order in advance at this market than anywhere else but it still has plenty of traffic. Uh, for live buyers and it's important for us to sort of analyze all the information. I've sort of mentioned this in the past but we don't just send the same amount of stuff everywhere. We look to see how many people actually go to those markets. We try to analyze what people are actually interested in and uh, interests vary uh, across different demographics and different groups of people. So. We try to log all the data that we can about what people are buying when, how much. We made these proof banners a while ago. So this is hand painted by a former crew member and we uh, just clip. So everything sort of fits together. 
What I really like about this setup is then you can use the space that's left behind the banner to store things that you don't want uh, kind of in people's faces. And so then we just spread this out. And put our focus on the table. So we're just packaging pre-orders now. Each of these has a label with what, what goes in this uh, bag and the quantity. So we have them all pre-sorted. So this, all the bread that's on this particular tower belongs to pre-orders. And then we just have to get this all packaged before the start of market. Yeah, if we don't, we can take lulls, although we can't really bank on that in the fall. Right now, it's, uh, right now the markets are a little bit more low key than normal, but normally they are pretty busy. And today, for all we know, people might end up showing up for either of the specials that we're running early. Typically, if we're running, running some sort of compelling special, people tend to show up a little earlier. So I need two of these. Uh, I did talk about those specials, but here they are in the flesh. This is the gochujang uh, sourdough. Gochujang is a Korean fermented uh, sweet pepper uh, paste. Uh, so fermented meaning it has a <laughs> funky smell before it bakes, but it has a really nice partially spicy flavor. Uh, and then we pair that with roasted garlic and green onions in the sourdough and it's pretty fantastic. Uh, the other special is the one that Dylan came up with. It's a uh, it's a curry sourdough. It's a Japanese curry sourdough, and it's crusted with black sesame seeds. So I, I really like the way that that one came out as well. It, they're both just uh, great specials, uh, super flavorful. So I, I think people are going to really like their bread this week. Last week we had run the same gochujang special, but it all was sold out by the time we got to market. So there was none left over for market. So now we put these completed orders here. So uh, rounding up the pastries today, you can see all the things that we produced from left to right. These are all, all croissant dough uh, base pastries up until the very last one, which is different. But this is our sourdough pan au chocolat. We use a local craft chocolate in it. Uh, it's almond croissant with a house-made frangipan uh, all the way through it. This is our sourdough croissant, which I need to find a sign for. We call this a queenie. Uh, it's inspired by a queen amon. It's an apple pastry with caramel on top. This is our toaster strudel. We typically have some sort of fresh fruit on the inside. Right now we're doing peaches. So it's a peach toaster strudel with a peach streusel on top. Uh, this is a salted rosemary twist. So it's croissant dough. Uh, braided and then topped with fresh rosemary and sea salt. And then this is actually a sweet roll. So this is not croissant dough. It's a sweet bread uh, with a peanut streusel on top. Uh, this is in, in, in Korea, this, these are called Saboro uh, rolls. And so it's fitting with our theme of sort of Asian inspired specials right now. This is the last pre-order to package. And so for a little while, we were doing all the pre-order packaging in-house. We'd gotten up to the point that all the markets had so many orders, especially since it seemed unsafe to shop any other way for a little while. So we were doing all this pre-order packaging back in the bakery, and it was really running into other issues for us. Uh, basically, it forced us to bake earlier because things needed to cool down enough to handle. And we started to get uh, upset with sort of the quality sacrifice of baking that early. So we have been, in the summer now, we've been packaging all the pre-orders at the market and finding that we can get away with it, uh, that there's enough time uh, to do so before the market. So now all the orders are packaged 
and we just got to kind of move some items out of the way to make our display look a little bit more beautiful. It's certainly not as beautiful as it was prior to a global pandemic where we're using more packaging now and taking away from some of the visual. Also, all this stuff is kind of hanging out back. So we're going to keep this, keep this one with us. It won't go any further than this. Uh, whereas in the past, we used to uh, kind of put all the products out on the table. And so it created a, a different visual appeal. Uh, maybe one day we can get back to that. Either way, I really like the way that the bread shelves are in the background. They, they're visible from a distance. In the winter time, we really fill the, the bread shelves. Prior to the pandemic, we used so minimal packaging. Basically, the bread that we produced went straight from the oven onto these, uh, onto these bread shelves and came into that state at, at market. And, and unfortunately, it just was no longer acceptable uh, with, with the current scenario. So everything was sort of mandated to be pre-packaged and we still sort of hate it. Uh, so there's, there's an element that, that is taken away from the bread uh, somehow in the, in the package. You know, we, we used minimal, minimal extras uh, when we made bread before. Uh, and, and now everything is in bags, but we, we use micro perforated bags for the whole loaves so they can breathe and the crust isn't uh, impacted. We have slice loaves over here in freezer bags. And really the slice loaves are meant, meant as freezer loaves. They're best frozen and then uh, the, the bread is best when you sort of take one slice at a time and, and toast it up. Whereas the whole loaves have a whole different journey in mind where uh, yeah, you sort of just cut what you need with a nice bread knife, keep them on your counter, uh, and, and don't really do anything to preserve them. Uh, so just putting up the rest of this product. And uh, for now, it's just going to have to stay this way for the foreseeable future in, in packaging. We might switch from the micro perforated bags to something a little bit better in sleeves. We're looking at it. But all the changes we make, they, they take a moment because, you know, we spend our, most of our time baking. and. Uh, then whatever balance of time we do spend uh, on, on administration, and those are little extras that there isn't always uh, time, time for. So now we just have to get ourselves organized so that our bags are easy to grab for us. We can put this one away. One of the local farms, you often see me wearing a hat, which I don't have on today. Steadfast Farm, I almost always have their hat on. Uh, they're setting up with some organic produce. Uh, I've really, one of my favorite tables to just peek at uh, is this farm over here. They do this all as a family and make all this, make the few things they make and grow the, the seasonal stuff they grow. And of course it's summer, so there's melons and squashes and that kind of thing. Not a whole lot of produce really takes to our crazy high temperatures. So our tomato garden right now is mostly dormant. We're getting, we're getting very small yields of tomatoes, but uh, we're waiting for lower lows uh, that will come in September, hopefully, where we'll start getting a little bit more tomatoes. But you can see here's another organic farmer over here uh, that's setting up. And you can see all the boxes on the right over there of people that have um, ordered ordered the CSA shares. So much of the farmer's market uh, setup right now is, is a little bit different. There's less vendors, there's more space uh, between them all. There's generally uh, less, less goods altogether, but, but a lot more focus on the essentials. So you see a lot more produce, a lot more breads, a lot more of the like essential groceries. Uh, you can see another farm over here that that also has an assortment of, of melons and they also have some local eggs there, some peppers, some things that you could really see growing here in the desert. Although they, they have a farm that's a few hours away, 
two sites. So they have one here um, in, the, in the valley area, and then they have one that's a few hours away in a completely different climate, still in Arizona. And so they're able to grow other, other produce. But the thing about market farmers and just, just in general fresh goods uh, that, that you buy, there's so much of a lack of information of where products are coming from and what they are. Even at a farmer's market, you have to be aware of the fact that sometimes farmer's markets are selling produce that's sort of bought from far away and brought in just like the grocery store. And so what I really love about this market in particular is the market does a lot of screening to sort of keep keep to the guidelines of, of actually locally produced uh, goods or in this case you know to to make a farmers market sustainable I think you have to allow farmers to grow in the region you know in, in the whole state so that they can take advantage of the different microclimates so several of farmers here have multiple sites that they grow on in different climates so that they can bring goods here year-round but obviously you're not going to see things like mangoes or avocados that just don't grow here uh, and, and if you do see things that aren't growing in your area and are out of season, I think that there should be a healthy skepticism uh, at, at least a farmer's market uh, because these markets are supposed to be that. They're supposed to be a farmer selling their goods. Uh, and when they become something other than that uh, and start to mimic grocery stores a little too much, uh, quality I think is robbed. That, that sense of local, small scale, supply chain is taken away when too many compromises are made on the rules. Uh, in that way, we, we also do our part to hold to the same type of values that you would expect from a local farmer. We use wheat that's been grown locally to, to the largest extent we can, which in our case is about 50% of the wheat that we use is locally grown. Uh, we use wheat that's milled locally. so. In, in a future segment, for sure, you're gonna probably see us out at the mill seeing more about the flour that we're producing. Uh, but it's stone milled uh, grains that, that are milled kind of the old fashioned way here in town. Uh, and then we're making bread in the most old fashioned way possible in sourdough, long fermented. This market represents even though it's new to this city, it's a new way of shopping in this city, it's only 25 years old here, worldwide it represents something uh, much more of historical value. And when the, when the whole pandemic erupted, since we've been talking about that today, it was uncertain what would happen with farmers markets. But really around the world, they all ended up, for the most part, staying open. The ones that were selling groceries, the ones that were selling essential goods, because that's what markets have done uh, through wartime, through all these other like unstable past events, including past pandemics. The only way people could get their food was gathering locally at markets. So when things started to get a little bit uncertain in the global supply chain, you still ended up seeing the exact same goods coming out to market that you did the week prior and the week prior to that. And I think the reason being was it's much harder to, to disrupt a local supply chain. Uh, the farmers here that are growing food, you know, in their in their lands here locally, uh, just because something happens somewhere else, doesn't really impact their ability to produce food on a local level or drive the few miles to the market to sell it here. And I think that's one of the reasons why markets are so important, as this uh, historical tie to the way things used to be. In the same way our bakery is set up that way where I might one day not be able to benefit from some of the modern tools that I have, but I've learned how to mix by hand and I've learned how to do things in kind of the old fashioned rudimentary way that anyone could do. You know, it, I've mentioned in the past a medieval baker could step into my bakery and if I could justify why the lights are on, then the rest of the work would be very comfortable. And, to some extent, I find it to be very important because it's freeing. It, it means that we can suffer some crazy global event and have methods of still doing what it is that we do for a living, that, that we do as a profession. We know how to do it in an old school, uh, 
simple way, but we also know how to do it the way that we do it now, which is still old school and simple, really. Like we're still using just technology that's assistive, not technology that's automating in any way. Uh, so, you know, we're still doing all the, the actual craft of making these things. We just, we end up spending a lot more time on detail now. We have, we have the time to braid these, uh, these products. We have the time to make sure that the layering is just perfect every time. And you can see all the layers in these pastries and the time that's gone into laminating these. Uh, we're able to just execute at higher volumes, but still in, in a very uh, artisan fashion. Uh, and, and then we come out to these markets that we've been doing since day one, and this is our community. So the, the people that end up coming back from market to a really nice brunch of pastries or end up enjoying our bread throughout the week, they'll come back next week again. We see familiar faces uh, week in, week out, and that's part of what really makes what we do so special and so fun and so gratifying. Uh, back in the times where we weren't getting any sleep, this really was what gave us the energy to continue, is seeing everybody out here, seeing everybody come together with all the production that they had done all week, knowing that somebody else also was in a challenging set of circumstances throughout the week, not only us. Yet you know, I think that if you look at any farmers here, they probably have crazier stories than I do to tell. You know, they don't, they don't get to produce in ovens, they have to produce in the earth, you know. It, it doesn't get more natural and bound to the weather than that. Uh, so I, I think that, that really the, the most painful moments in our history still probably pale in comparison to some of the things that other vendors around here like farmers have to go through just to stay in business and stay alive. And I think that the point of a farmer's market really is the community investing in their local food is is the community coming together and saying yes we are willing to pay a little bit more to ensure that food is produced locally so the next time something crazy happens there are people here in this community that know how to grow food that understand the seasons and don't just create a food desert around where we're living uh, it is, it is, Amanda mentioned the word uh, so, so, sovereign, so the idea of being sovereign and, and to, have, to have that aspect around your food, to not have to be dependent on another area. Just look at Lebanon right now. 80% of their food is imported. They just had a big blowout at the port and what are they gonna do? So Lebanon is going through a crazy crisis right now and Amanda's Lebanese, her whole family is Lebanese. So when that big explosion happened in Beirut recently, the, the level of pain that's being experienced there is, is rippling across the world with all the people that fled Lebanon in the 80s and civil war, including Amanda's family. And the fact that things still are systemically so difficult and so corrupt uh, between the people and their government. Uh, so the idea of being able to produce food, yeah, Amanda's family, when they first immigrated here, that's, what, that's part of what they did for a living was they had a farmer's market stand producing Lebanese food. There is something empowering about being able to do something as simple as producing food, which all of us do, and then being able to turn that into something that supports you and supports not only you, but puts food on your table, both in what you make and then puts dollars in your bank account. Uh, in these sort of growing uncertain times, I would argue that more people ought to return to this style of living. Uh, the fact that more farmers markets are popping up in this city, I think it should be happening all over the place because more garage bakeries, means more people that are going to invest in local stone mills, means more local stone mills opening up their doors and having business, means more heritage grains being grown uh, nearby in your climate. Uh, I don't see anything but benefits, but returning to some of these old school practices. That's not to say that we should dump the modern, uh, because we have a huge population to feed, and there is room for both in, in what we do. 
It's just to say that there is value in community produced food. Uh, there's value in bread produced in the community that doesn't rise to this level because understand that what we produce is years in the making, lots and lots of effort and practice and execution and in infrastructure. It wasn't always this, frankly, I mean, I look at the table and it's like, it's so good, you know, it's, it looks so nice even though I would rather have a more abundant table display and I'd rather not have my mask on right now, I'd rather it be the way it was a year ago. However, at the same time, I look at the, the actual quality of the production and the people that did it and the fact that the people that did it are getting paid fair wages, they love their jobs, they get to come into a small work environment, uh, it's easy for them to stay safe in that work environment. Uh, and then we can just, as, as owners, we can just be so proud of our team and, and the work that they're doing on a regular basis. We, we can put our efforts into supporting them and supporting the overall infrastructure of the business. It wasn't always like this. At, at, for the majority of the time, it's us struggling to get through the bake to get here in time. Always though with our eyes set on what might come in the future and where we might be able to evolve. So the market has been this sort of, it's been this place where we feel like there's an endless possibility. There's way more people that come into the market than stop at our stand. And so we feel like if we could just reach more of those people by connecting to their memories, by connecting to their cultural roots. So bringing in new flavor profiles that Maybe, maybe somebody wasn't, maybe a Korean person walking through the market wouldn't go for an artisan sourdough loaf that is more akin to, to Western Europe or Eastern Europe, but maybe the fact that we put a flavor in there that they're very comfortable with, gochujang, maybe that's a bridge. And, and I would argue that it has been because the Koreans that have commented since we uh, sort of released this bread has said, I've never tried that flavor combination before. And I imagine that some of them went home and, and started messing with this flavor combination. I really love the fact that at the market there's just this wide variety of people all with their own experiences and stories. And that's really what we're connecting with. Uh, people come up to our booth and they're forming those memories. So the kids that come to our booth now, they're going to remember eating those fresh croissants as kids. and that's what they're gonna be craving as adults. Uh, that's, that's exactly the type of people that are coming to our booth right now, is people that remember from their past experiences with fresh bakeries uh, and, and loving that. So uh, this is our first customer of the day. Good morning. Good morning. How's it going? Good, how are you? Good. Good. We're several weeks into trials. Behind the scenes, there's always something being tested while something else is being featured. What you should look out for, I'm gonna give you a, a preview. Next week, we are moving that gochujang to a savory croissant pinwheel. Love what you guys do, love your product. Well, I appreciate you following and, and enjoy that special this week. Good morning, have you had our bread before? Or, oh, well, welcome. It's not working, right? Like. It says two connected, but then it says unavailable. I'm gonna forget them both. I'm trying to get this little box to pair and connect. And today, I'm gonna to blame you, Amanda. It's because you put pictures of all the stuff on our POS yesterday. Technology problems. Each we rotate this one seasonally with like different fresh fruit. So everything that we make is here right now. Amanda will take care of you at the end, and it's going to be twelve dollars today. Okay. Thank you so much. Absolutely, nice meeting you. Nice meeting you, man. I really like them both, like as a burger bun or as a breakfast sandwich. Yeah. So. And that's a gochujang uh, sourdough on the bottom. It's a Korean fermented pepper. You want to get one of those? Yeah. Okay. That's a good choice. I basically just have to look for the one I like, and then I'll find it for you. This week it's only in a loaf, but it's almost like you read our mind because next week you might find it in a savory croissant pinwheel. So this one's slightly got a little bit of heat to it, not overbearing. Even somebody that doesn't like heat would still enjoy it. Okay. Uh, it's got green onions and roasted garlic, so those really round out the flavor of the gochujang tastes like the best bowl of soup you've ever had, okay. except without the heat of the soup. Like, 
the, the black sesame and the curry spice go really well together and it's more than curry, it's that blend between the black sesame and the curry that really dominates that flavor. So $8 and Amanda will take care of you here at the end. Hi, good morning. Okay, I saw yours. There it is. Thank you so much. No problem. Peanut roll, a chocolate, and a gochujang. Nice to meet you. Do you guys want to try anything today? So uh, just a queenie for these guys. Thank you very much, you guys. This thing right here, there's only one of these at the whole market. Out of all few thousand croissants that we made, there's only one of these. So that's because it's a test product. This is a pretzel croissant. Uh, and so it's finished just like a pretzel. Uh, We've been working on that for a little while. No one has tried one other than me and Dylan and a few others working on them. But he, he's been making them for me on Saturday mornings and just throwing it on the truck. Uh, so it's kind of fun being the only one around that has, has this product and it's a very good one too. I feel like the special, like I feel like Steve Jobs with his uh, prototype iPhones years before everybody has them except it's just a croissant, but nonetheless, pretty fun. Good morning. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Hi. This is one of our original crew members. So I think he was like employee number four or something like yeah. that. When, when Brian first joined, we had four people on our crew and it was like this incredible, awesome, original crew. Brian ended up going out and becoming a, a chef at one of the best kitchens in town right after leaving Proof. And that was his dream all along. Didn't you like, what's the whole story with bread? Like, why did you end up torturing yourself in our bakery, hand mixing? Because we were buying bread, you guys were always sold out every <laughs> week. And so I had to like message you guys individually on Instagram. And once I, uh, once I got a hold of you guys, you had me come over, I got some bread and the story is that, like, you know, I just started working just because I needed bread and it was a cool place. And This guy is one of those, like, kitchen guys that will show up at any time of the day, do anything you ask of them, nothing's too hard. So he would, like, come in and hand mix. And so long as I kept him off the shaping table, because if I remember correctly, your hands stuck to everything. everything yeah. <laughs> they stuck to everything. They still do. Still? Uh, yeah. Even with all the pasta you've been making uh, now? Maybe Maybe a little less, but with bread, it's a different day. It's a different day. Did you get your bread yet? No. I what do you need? Just one sourdough. Okay. So this is about the time where I start kind of getting an idea of what sold too quickly. We got rid of toaster strudels and almond croissants and salted rosemary twists too quickly. Uh, the rest of the stuff we still have a good amount of. It's only been 55 minutes, so it's been a pretty busy first hour here. Um, I, usually on a lull, I will check the numbers and just see how we're doing in comparison to previous weeks. Uh, actually, it looks like today, overall, across all the markets, we're up 20% over previous weeks with a similar amount of transactions, but people are spending a little bit more per transaction. So. That to me indicates that our specials really connected with, uh, with people today, that, that they're buying specials in addition to buying whatever they normally buy. There are a few more people out. Uh, so right now there were, there's actually a 9% uptick in people, which translated to 24 customers across the board in four markets. So all of these metrics sort of help us figure out what it is we need to make. Uh, we still have a long way to go, three whole hours, so we're gonna see how all this stuff fares over three hours. We've primarily been selling out every week, um, which is the goal. It, anything that stays that we don't sell at a market on a Saturday when we're not producing tomorrow or doing anything tomorrow, it becomes difficult to know what to do with. It's better to sell out even if we you know, our goal is to kind of get as close to the end before it happens. Uh, that's what we're going for. And so each product has a number uh, 
and it's sort of correlated to the traffic of the market. So we try to get to that number per market that you know, we can sort of cap. Um, for the most part, we've learned how to do this really well. In the beginning, it was not always so easy to forecast and predict, but over time you see the same patterns repeat over and over again, and you can sort of make decisions across those. There's some level of just intuition though too, when you bring something new, whenever something changes or the seasons change, you have to kind of intuitively know how much you can push the boundary. Uh, and so we've done this a few times now, every single Saturday with the exception of, I don't know, we've probably only taken like six or seven Saturdays off in three years. So we've done this 150 times or so, times four or five markets. You could say we've had a little bit of experience. This market right now is up 25% from last week uh, in about the same amount of people though. So again, people are spending on average $2 more with every single transaction and that adds up. So um, that's one of the reasons from a financial standpoint that running specials makes a lot of sense. Uh, it gets people trying new things and trying additional things. So uh, in the summertime, it's extremely important when there's only so many people that are willing to venture out in 120 degrees to begin with. It might seem busy, it, maybe it seems slow to you. I don't know what you do for a living, but for us, this is very slow in comparison to what we see in November, December. We're thankful for the regular traffic, but in November, December, we just get annihilated here. So in a good way. Hi. Hi.